Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Crillo. Today, we have Blake Janover. He has more than 15 years of experience in real estate capital markets. Blake has overseen the underwriting and origination of billions of dollars of commercial, multifamily, and residential real estate loans, and has advised on many billions of dollars more. So thank you so much for being on the show, Blake. Thank you for having me. So give us a little background of yourself prior to starting your current firm. Sure. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't want to bore you, but I've got, I suppose, more than 15 years experience in the space. And uh, it, I've always kind of been at the cross section of real estate finance and technology. Uh, when I was there initially, this was in the very early 2000s. So, so technologies were very nascent around uh, uh, residential and commercial property finance. <clears throat> Since then, things have evolved and I've kind of tried to be a part of that uh, the, the whole way. So originally, uh, my original, original start was uh, as, I mean, really beginnings, I was a residential mortgage broker. Uh, and then I kind of grew within the company, opened up my own residential mm -hmm. mortgage brokerage, became a direct lender, got into commercial and kind of went through this whole path uh, in my very, very early 20s. Um, and it's just kind of, it, it's kind of been a part of my, uh, I, like entrepreneurship with, with, with real estate finance and technology. This is just kind of like, this is, I'm, I'm in this weird place and, and this is kind of who I am and I've been there for a long time and I'm going to be there for a long time more. Nice. Okay. Well, what does your uh, current firm Janover Adventures do and how do you differentiate yourself from other brokers and lenders? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so, uh, Think of us kind of like, like rocket mortgage, but for commercial real estate, for multifamily. Um, except when I think rocket mortgage, which is a Quicken company, they make loans. And instead of us making loans, we're kind of matching borrowers and lenders, kind of like Tinder, but uh, you, you don't, you don't get laid. Uh, oh, you might have to, you might have to edit that part out. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, People go through our folks go through our portal. Borrowers can go into our portal, and they have this interaction with a really in a really friendly user environment. And we intelligently match them to the right lender, and we help make the process a little less uh, painful. So we're we we just started this in 2019, um, and we tripled revenue uh, in 2020. And we did uh, just shy of a couple hundred million dollars of originations. And we have, we, we don't have a sales force, you know, uh, it's, it's all technology driven. I was looking on your website and you guys really cover, I mean, all aspects of commercial multifamily investing. So is there anything that you guys really focus on or is it just pretty much almost any type of property can be brought through to your system and uh, you guys can find a lender for it? Any property can come through and we can find a lender for it. I would say that right now, because we're, we're small, uh, we can't be the best at everything. So we're the best, like the best, best right now at uh, stabilized uh, multifamily property over a million and probably multifamily construction over 5 million. But that being said, uh, we did everything from $20 million single tenant office construction loans last year through a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollar SBA seven A loans. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to to build a platform that unifies uh, supply and demand uh, for commercial property finance and make this uh, easier uh, for everybody to transact. Do you guys work with foreign investors, or is that on the horizon? If you don't already, uh, we have programs that cater to foreign investors. I just okay. had a really cool call with a buddy of mine that's going to go run a, a fintech that focuses on foreign investors. So I hope that we'll be uh, having some cool API uh, connection with them somehow in the not too distant future. Yeah, it's an underserved uh, population of people and investors that are interested in coming here and uh, finding it very difficult or very expensive or both to uh, get involved. 
yeah, and a lot of them have to physically be here to do it, and it shouldn't be that painful. Uh, we're it's 2021, I think, and uh, you should be able to verify identity and digitally sign. So uh, expect these things on uh, on the horizon. So what is how does the I mean. Anybody's gotten a loan before. I mean, they know how cumbersome it is and um, the bureaucracy that goes with it. And I know you've kind of coined this phrase, I believe, uh, frictionless financing. So can you describe to us the difference in the process, let's say, of going to a traditional mortgage broker or lender or working through your firm? Yeah, I'm taking notes right now uh, mm -hmm. so, I, so I don't forget anything. Uh, so you said I coined frictionless financing and I wanna say that I did, but I stole that. Um, like all my good ideas, they're borrowed and iterated upon, but I was at a, uh, uh, anecdotally, I was at uh, the, I think it was the first leveraging FinTech to grow and compete or, or FinTech innovation at Harvard Business School. And one of my favorite takeaways was that, uh, that the role of a fintech is to reduce frictions in finance. So I just I I grabbed that from a professor that was way smarter than me, and I and I reuse it. So, <laughs> what's what's the difference? I, I feel like I feel like a great way to 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 address it might be might be in this friction framework. So I I really wanted to solve for a problem that I experienced many times as an advisor and intermediary, and, and even as a GP and a sponsor, right? So here's what happens. I have a deal um, myself. I either call a broker or I call a bunch of banks. And then I have the same damn conversation 15 <laughs> times over. Nobody remembers what anybody else said. There's 45 disparate emails going around. I submitted a T12 to one person. They edited it and submitted it to someone else. And, and, then, and then the appraiser calls back and the PCA guy calls back and he says, hey, I need a T12. And this guy needs a T12. And there's 12 T12s floating around. And, and I don't know what, and it's not, it shouldn't be like that, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm asked the same question 20 times. And if, and if I'm an individual talking to multiple banks, now I'm asking the same question. I'm answering the same question multiple times. So the first thing that we're addressing is how do we how do we make this less brain damage? So we've got something that's kind of like a digital processor, a digital originator. Uh, we internally we call it IQ2, but it's it's a simple fintech portal, and it and it's it's like a Q and A and document collection. Um, based on highly uh, contingent and, and dynamic inputs is, is kind of what's next in the chain. So when I was, when I was very active as an intermediary individually, um, has the spaceship landed? <laughs> no, sorry. <about> that. <laughs> No, it's okay. When I was very active as an intermediary, I used to tell the story of, yeah, you, you know, you need my, my big brain and all my experience because it's intuition and there's an art to this. And maybe there is. But what I've found is that a lot of our intuition is very basic if this then that flows. So if somebody tells me uh, I'm a foreign investor, I know intuitively that I need to find out what your experience is What's your net worth? What's your liquidity? What's your US-based liquidity? What's your US-based portfolio? Who are you gonna use as a property manager? If you tell me that the property is at 80% uh, physical occupancy, I need to find out what the economic occupancy is. Um, if, if you, and, and this is getting further into our development, we're not here yet, but if you, if, if you submit a, a, a trailing 12 month, month by month P&L, and the RNM is high relative to the market because eventually we're going to be pulling APIs through pulling on Yardi's API and, and on Rianomy perhaps and places like that. We'll know what the what the market RNM is. And we could say, hey, do you have CapEx uh, built into your RNM over here? Because you actually have to break that out. But these are this isn't this isn't intuition. This is experience and and data in aggregate. And I feel like I'm like I'm like I'm intuiting these things, but really it's just, if this, then that. And we're trying to build that into a, a beautiful user interface and make it as painless as possible. That was long-winded. You should stop asking me questions.
No, it's fine. That's perfect because it's uh, it's definitely something that I've had before is uh, especially with smaller properties when I'm getting loan amounts under a million dollars and I'm not going agency debt route and um, you're working with local banks and it's the same thing. Uh, small banks and credit unions where you are uh, you're, you're talking to so many different people and uh, you're trying to find a specific product uh, from them and see if they offer it. And it's very difficult because you get a lot of apples and oranges. Like I've spoken to people before and say, um, hey, yeah, we're a direct lender. And then I spoke to uh, another lender like a week later and they go, oh, we already have yours in. And I said, who submitted it in? They go, oh, it was this guy. He's a broker. And I go, he, and I contact him. And they go, I thought you were a direct lender. And they go, we are just not on this property type. Well, information that would have yeah. been helpful to me before I submit to you. But you keep on going back and forth through all this. And then if you get to a bank, one of my last times refinancing a property, I was dealing with it and they put me with someone that had never done that type of property before. They'd never done this commercial uh, property before that I had, uh, like done a refinancing for it. So it's, it, you know, you're, it's not the most, it's not frictionless, let's say, right? And um, it's, it's definitely something that uh, I think when you're getting more into agency debt, it becomes a little bit more streamlined maybe because uh, it's easier to get those loans. But I feel on the smaller properties, it's an, I mean, it's just like a nightmare trying to get financing. If you have a specific idea of, I want a 10 year term or 15 year term, and I want 25 plus year amortization and uh, all these things. And um, to, to do apples to apples where they're telling you, oh, this is the right, well, what's the spread? What index are you using? Um, so then I can really compare my different offerings and it literally takes you days to do it. And unless you have a broker and with a broker, you usually have to fill in a lot of stuff yourself. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you're just utilizing a contact that they have. So if I was getting like working with a credit union or a commercial bank, right, I'm going to start this relationship, hopefully months before I actually need the money. How does it work with your company? When does someone reach out to you? So the best way is kind of when you're ready to go, because we take out the months of back and forth with a dozen lenders. We try to remove that brain damage and match you immediately to the right lender. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, it's, it's an iterative process and, and, and we're getting better at it uh, every day, I think. Also, I wanna to speak to your agency thing and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna disagree, I just wanna give another perspective. So not all agency lenders are created equal. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. So let's say there's the Fannie Small program. Mm -hmm. Now, Fannie Small releases its guidelines. I'm not gonna use lender names, even though I want to, yeah. but, but lender A might make a Fannie Mae uh, small loan for $2 million in a tertiary market at 80% LTV, less COVID reserves on a 30 year fix to a first time multifamily borrower uh, and, and at, at competitive pricing. Lender B, might not even want to touch that deal because there's risk sharing, or they might look at that deal, but they might apply Freddie SBL terms to it because they want to, they want to apply more conservative terms to it, whatever it is. So you could have two Fannie Mae lenders that have Fannie SBL that offer two totally different programs. Then you could have a third Fannie Mae SBL lender who's just recently approved with Fannie SBL and all their stuff has to get kicked up to Fannie and approved. And there's no exceptions, everything's inside a box. And this just, just doesn't just go for Fannie. Freddie SBL has a uh, different product Products within its umbrella. One company may have it, one company may not. One, one, bet, one lender may be more incentivized internally to do Freddie SBL than Fannie SBL, even if Fannie has a better product or has a product that fits that deal better. And then this goes all the way up the, all, all the, way up the product structure. It goes to Fannie Dust, it goes to Freddie Conventional, it goes to FHA. If you think not all Fannie lenders are created equal, all FHA lenders aren't created equal. Yeah. And we just closed uh, a $15 million HUD 221D4 for a public housing authority uh, through our platform. So we're really seeing um, a little bit of everything and there's room for improvement everywhere. I really believe that we can disintermediate uh, this uh, really fractured uh, uh, commercial real estate finance economy. Yeah. Does it, does your working with your platform, obviously it connects you to the best lender uh, right away. Does it speed up the process? Because usually it's, you know, you're half, uh, you're uh, two, three weeks into something and then there's another document, then there's another document, then there's another document. And uh, it's an endless thing until you've uh, pretty much sent them everything and the kitchen sink. And is that, 
are, I mean, how is that differing with, with your platform or is it similar? Cause it's still the lenders kind of running the show at the end of it. Yeah. Right now where we are, the lenders running the show at the end of it. So you have all the initial, uh, mess, uh, <laughs> smoothed out, right? You got one place where you're getting all the information in, 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 into one spot, you're getting matched to the right lender and, 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 and you're qualified like initially through that. So as we're going to, we're, we're actually about to launch by the time this is live, we'll have launched a new round. We're raising money nice. and we're going to hire engineers and uh, we're going to continue to build out this platform because the goal is to, is to make this whole process easier from credit to appraisal to bank processing. We really want to just get right into the meat of it and make this whole thing easier. I just closed on a residential mortgage and it was like, it was easy peasy. And it should be like that for commercial too. There's, mm -hmm. it's not as complex as it's sold to be. It's complex. There's a lot of variables, but it's manageable. It's all manageable. And with technology today, uh, it should be solved for. So, so we're working on that. So what should, uh, when investors are coming to you, what, what important factors of a real estate transaction should they be focused on when obtaining financing? Because you'll have, I know when you're getting a commercial, obviously there's less on eyes on the borrower per se and more on the asset compared to with residential where it's all about the personal person. Um, but what does it mean? Like what, what should they be really focused on uh, when they're coming to you, whether it's complete financials, having a good credit score, um, making sure that the property is going to service debt. I mean, is, is there anything that you see that um, should really be the main focus of investors when they're reaching out to a lender? Well, for us, we're really trying to create that catch-all. So I've got bad credit and a $200,000 loan, or I've built a thousand units before, and I'm looking for a $20 million D4. But you know, it, it really differs per deal. So when you're looking for financing for, let's say, uh, a small commercial or, or, or multifamily loan under maybe $500,000, it really has very little to do with the property and a lot to do with you. Do you have good credit? I'm looking at your global cash flow, looking at your tax returns. If you're coming in on the agency side, if you're looking for a multifamily loan over a million, then you want the cumulative net worth of the sponsorship to be greater than the loan amount. You want the cumulative liquidity of the sponsorship backing out retirement accounts to be generally greater than 10% of the loan amount. Um, you. My personal advice is, uh, is to be surrounded by great people, right? And that's not something that financing requires, but my personal advice is hire the right property managers, hire the right lawyers, um, bring in the right partners. And uh, that's, that, that's the stuff that's really important. Uh, qualifying for a deal, all of these, all of these things kind of push and pull against each other. I've got bad credit. Okay. How's the debt service coverage ratio? What does your other partner look like? How's your net worth? How's your liquidity? How far are you from the property? Um, so there's no one thing I wish there was. That would... No, it makes perfect sense. The, so really it's having their, having your team put together, your outside team, your property managers, your attorneys. And if you need to have partners for the deal, the deals that you're looking at, make sure that you have them to fill out the experience and fill out the net worth kind of portions of, uh, of deal before they're coming out to you. I feel like you know this stuff better than I do. And I like that you're giving me the opportunity to play along. Uh, I should be asking you the questions. No, thank you very much. So what mistakes do you commonly see real estate investors make? That's easy. I have a favorite. I have a favorite. I want to give an example. So my favorite, it's not a favorite mistake, right? Like I don't want anybody to make mistakes, but this is the one that like really comes to mind. I'm John Doe. Uh, my, my parents weren't creative um, and that's my name. So they've named, they named me John Doe. And I, and I, and I, John, I live in LA and I'm looking at deals. I'm looking at my first multifamily deal or my second or my third and everything's a two cap. I can't make any money. There's every, it's, it's miserable and I want yield. I want yield. So I go on LoopNet and I find a 14 cap in Memphis. And I think, oh gosh, I, I'm a genius. And, and I put the deal under contract and I pull the trigger. And the mistake that, that I think people miss is that returns are risk adjusted 
And what you see is not always what you get. So the 14 cap that Marcus and Millichap shows you uh, may be pro forma and may not contemplate all expenses. Um, if you find a real 14 cap, uh, you may need to wear a Teflon vest to go collect your rents. Um, and it may not be as easy uh, as you think. And a kind of like a second order thing to contemplate is you probably are sacrifice. There, there, there's a push and pull. There's a play between yield and long-term appreciation. And you may find that where yield is wanting, uh, there may be a, a greater opportunity for long-term appreciation, whereas uh, where yield is generous, uh, there may be limited prospects to, uh, and, and that's not in every deal, right? Gentrification happens, but um, it's, it's thinking that you're a genius. When, when I was kind of taught, if it looks too good to be true, sometimes it is. Yeah. The other thing too is that when people are looking at returns from assets, we're exiting assets right now. And to be realistic that, well, this portion of the return is because we know what we're doing. And this portion of it is because we're lucky and we purchased three years ago, or we were in, you know, we were on the, in the water and we caught the wave coming in. It wasn't because I'm a genius. And I think that people kind of have to break that up when they're looking at returns, whether it's their properties or properties they might be investing or operators they might invest with in the future that, you know, if it levels out in a little bit coming here, you're, you're not going to have that other boost to the return. You know, it's a little more, it, it it's, it's a little more aggressive to contemplate cap rate compression now than it mm -hmm. was three, four or five years ago. Yeah. Right. No, that's for sure. That's it's uh, it's completely changed. The other thing too, about your, your Memphis property, when you think you found that 14 cap there, there's a reason why multi-billion dollar life insurance companies are buying a four cap, a quality property in Dallas. Right. 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 And they're not buying the 14 cap in Memphis that you thought you were a genius and found that's been sitting on LoopNet for nine months, right? Oh, here's here's another one. Uh, you didn't ask, but I, I just, you, you know, you're stuck with me on here. Um, this one's less funny. So this is, I found a deal and, and I'm going to buy it and it's a six cap. And I'm buying it from a person that's owned the property for 40 years. It's a $5 million deal. This person bought it for $100,000 and they're paying no real estate taxes. They're paying uh, five grand a year, whatever the stupid number is. It's really important that when you get your, your offering memorandum or your deal or your package or whatever it is, you figure out what the millage rate is in that county, what they're charging for taxes. You, you reach out, you confirm it and you apply that number because even if you're a genius or, or a manipulator or you've got connections to the mob and you're able to keep the real estate taxes low, you're appraiser, nobody's going to underwrite the real estate tax number that you think that you're going to get to. They're going to underwrite what the what the conservative realistic scenario is. And that's going to, and, and that's probably where you're going to end up to. So they're going to underwrite. Uh, so that's going to change your debt service coverage ratio, your cap rate. It's going to change everything. Um, and, and I see people miss that sometimes. Yeah, that's the first thing I look at when you're vetting a new investor if they've readjusted that. And then you look at the rents, what they're, what they're proposing. But the thing is, the real estate taxes will tell you, and I think a lot of brokers I've spoken to agree with me that, um, you know, that's the first thing to look at on the underwriting with someone has adjusted that. And uh, it's a, it's a, makes a huge difference. And it's something that, uh, you know, no matter what your debt's fixed at, your property taxes are not. So it's something that will change over the years. I've never seen an offering memorandum where this sell side broker accurately on the money <laughs> estimates uh, what the new real estate tax bill is going to be. No, for sure. Obviously, they're they're keeping it at uh, at what they think or what it is now currently. But yeah. um, what do you think are your main factors that have contributed to your success, Blake? As a human, just as in you've been in your business with all the years and decades of experience you have, being an entrepreneur, being involved with fintech. Yeah. Um, this is going to be cliche and cheesy. Am I allowed to shoot? So I guess the number one contributor would be failure. Um, I've had more failures than anybody I've ever met. I've had businesses blow up, ideas blow up all the time. I'm wrong all the time. I've run my head into many walls many times. So this failure, uh, it kind of creates 
humility and motivation. I'm not saying that I'm that I'm humble, uh, you know. It's but but I I I'd like to be. I aim to be. But the kind of like the second order consequence of the of the continued failures has been my um, constant search to learn and get better and improve. So I'm. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm a voracious reader. Another way to say that is that I'm a, I'm a bookworm. Um, I, I study in all my free time. I ask uh, a lot of questions. And uh, I, I forget who said this. It might be um, Mark, Andr Mark Andreessen or, uh, or Ben Horowitz, but it's, but no, maybe it was Paul Graham. But it's something like uh, I have strong opinions loosely held. So uh, I, I think I can accredit some of my success to, I have like very serious conviction towards whatever the heck I'm pointing at, but if somebody's got like a, a materially better idea or can prove that my idea is wrong, I can pivot without even yeah. thinking. I, I, I give, I do not care at all about uh, being right or wrong in this context. If I'm arguing with my wife, I, I care about being right or wrong. But in the context of business, I, I, I don't care. I just want to be in the right direction. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. Going back to about the reading, I had a, a mentor before that would take off Fridays just for reading. It was very interesting. I'd never heard anybody do that before. But um, I'm most successful people are, are, are big readers. So that's great. Buffett reads all day. That's literally from, from first thing. He, he can read up to four books a day. That guy is Jeez. a badass. Yeah. I'm one a week. I, I, I've got a ways to go. Oh, wow. That's still, that's still fantastic. I tell people to start off with 10 pages a day. That's something you can yeah. do, easily do and you'll do a book a month. So that's fantastic. So how can our listeners learn more about you and your business? Well, uh, they can, you can look me up on LinkedIn. It's Blake Janover, J-A-N-O-V-E-R. And you can, you can ping me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. You can email me at Blake at Janover.Ventures. I'll either respond in like three seconds or three weeks. It's uh, so if, if, if you don't have an Insta response, just understand, like, it'll be there eventually. Uh, you can visit us online at janover.ventures. That's not .com or .net or .co. It's just janover.ventures. And, uh, or you could just rewatch or re-listen to this podcast because uh, this is, you know, this is it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. What I'll do is I will put those links all into the show notes and uh, everybody can reach out to you. So thank you so much for coming on today, Blake. Thank you, brother. This was a lot of fun. I hope you'll have me again sometime. Definitely. Yeah. After you have those new APIs put and uh, your what's going on here with your next stage, we'd love to have you back on. I'll be here. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Hi, guys. It's Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in getting involved with real estate, but you don't know where to begin, set up a free 30-minute strategy call with me at ScheduleCharles.com. That's ScheduleCharles.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.